Welcome folks to this tutorial. In this tutorial, we are gonna discuss the basics of feedback systems using MATLAB. So let me start with the outline of this lecture. The first thing we're gonna look at is what I call the partial fraction expansion and how MATLAB will use the partial fraction expansion. Basically, MATLAB will use a command called a residue to do that. Then I would like to discuss the inverse of Laplace transforms and to find the inverse of Laplace transforms, we use the partial fraction expansion. And then I'm going to discuss the transfer function and how MATLAB uses the transfer function in its calculations. Then I will introduce the state space equations and how MATLAB uses the state space equations. And then I will look at the block diagram and how MATLAB can simplify the block diagrams that are connected in series or connected in parallel or connected in feedback configuration. Then I will look at the time domain analysis and in the time domain analysis we're going to look at the step response and then we're going to look at the impulse response and then we're going to look at the ramp response and then we're going to look at the response to any arbitrarily input and finally, we're going to look at the response to any arbitrarily initial conditions. So let's start with the first concept that we're going to discuss today, which is the partial fraction expansion. And basically, the partial fraction expansion in MATLAB is evaluated using a command called the residue command. So the residue command is the command we use to evaluate the partial fraction expansion. And let me show you the syntax for it. When we have the residue, when we use the residue command, we pass two vectors to it. The first vector, I called it num, stands for the numerator. And the second vector, I called it den, which stands for the denominator vector. Those vectors contain the coefficients of the polynomials in the numerator and the denominator. What the residue command will return, it will return three vectors for us, the R, the P, and the G, where the R vector is what I call the partial fraction values, and the P is what I call the vector that contains the poles, and then the G is a vector for the polynomial coefficients that only exist when the rational function is improper function. So let me look at a very quick example here. Let's assume that we have this rational function. The numerators are s cubed plus 2s squared minus s, and the denominator is s squared plus 3s plus 2. So it is clear that this function is improper function because the order of the numerator is bigger than the order of the denominator. So when we do the partial fraction expansion for that, I will have a polynomial, which will be s minus 1. And then I have two partial terms, like shown here. And the two partial terms here are two, are two terms because the order of the denominator is a second order, right? So... Uh, so the question now is how would I use the residue command for this rational function? So the first thing I have to do is define the numerator and the denominator vectors. The numerator vector, I can call it any name, but I'm calling it here num. The numerator vector is basically the coefficients of the numerator polynomials. So I have 1 stands for s cubed, and I have 2 stands for uh, uh, the term with s squared and then I have minus 1 for the term that contains the s and because the dc coefficient is 0 I have to include 0 here if I didn't include a 0 here it will assume that this is a second order polynomial so you have to always end by the 0th coefficient the, the 0th order coefficient in case of the denominator I call the vector den, stands for denominator, and it has three values here, so you see three values here. 
The first coefficient will be the s squared. The second coefficient will be the s value. And the third coefficient is the zero with order coefficient, which is two. So now once I defined those two vectors for the numerator and the denominator, I'm ready to use the residue command. So I will, I know that the residue command will return for me three vectors. I call them R, P, and J. I can call them any name, but I call them here R, P, and J. And then I use the residue and I pass the numerator vector to the residue first and then the denominator vector. So after I pass the numerator vector, I pass the denominator vector. If I don't want to echo the value of P and G, put a semicolon. If I want to echo that, I will not put a semicolon. So let's run this example and see what we will get. Will we get similar values like what we have here or not? And let's see that on MATLAB. So let me start the MATLAB program. Uh, here is the MATLAB program. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new script. So here is a new script. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to comment this line. And I will call, I will call this line tutorial three underscore one dot m and I would like to save the file name to be with that name tutorial three underscore and then I will hit enter so now we're gonna enter the coefficients for the same uh, rational function that we have so I will have the vector num and the vector num will equal to I have uh, 1, 2, minus 1, and 0. And let me comment that for uh, the numerator. Oh, and I need to close the bracket here. So this is the first vector for the numerator coefficients. Now I'm going to call the vector then for the denominator coefficients and what I have is 1, 3, and 2 and let me comment that to say for the denominator okay so now I have uh, the two vectors up what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna now use the residue command, I know the residue command will give me three values, R, P, and G. And that will equal to the residue. And then I will have the two vectors, the num and the din. And I'm not going to put a semicolon. Let's save the program. If we didn't make any typo errors, it should run. Let me verify one more time. I think that is correct as of I think it is correct so let's run it and see what we get oh, it did give me the same values I have it gave me the values of the partial terms which are the values are minus 2 and 2 it gave me the balls which are at minus 2 and minus 1 and it gave me the values of the coefficients of 1 and minus 1 now, when MATLAB gives you those values, you have to go back and interpret what those values mean. So you have to know that the value minus 2 in the R vector is associated with the first ball, which is the ball at minus 2. And the value of 2 is associated with the second ball, which is the value of minus 1. Then you still have values for j and if you have values for j then you know that in this particular vector you know it's a it's a first order polynomial the zeroth order and the first order here so you know that j here stands for s minus one right and always the first term will be the highest order and the sec and the last term will be the zeroth order the zero order right zeroth order so this is how you do the residue command. 
uh, for uh, even improper functions, right? And it will give you the partial uh, fraction expansion. So let's go back to our uh, slide and uh, let's see what we have as we said here. We have this vector and this uh, rational function. And this rational function was uh, uh, transformed or converted into its partial terms. And those are the values of its partial terms, which is something that we can obtain from MATLAB. And we discussed how to get those commands, right? So let's move to the next topic where, where uh, now we are interested in finding the inverse of Laplace transforms. So finding the inverse of Laplace transforms uh, is based on what kind of uh, roots do we have or poles do we have. So if we have uh, unrepeated poles and they are real, like in this particular transfer function or this particular rational function, so if we have this rational function where we have uh, 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 first of all that this rational function is proper rational function which means the order of the denominator is bigger than the order of the numerator now we can break this transfer function into uh, two terms uh, so uh, let me show you what happened here is we have this rational function is broken down into two terms using the partial fraction expansion, then what I do is I find the inverse of the first term, which will have the value 3 times e to the minus 2t because the pole is located at minus 2, plus the value of the second term, which is minus 2, so I have minus 2 here, times e to the minus 1t because the pole is located at minus 1. Uh, the basic idea here is if you have a rational function, you uh, break it down into two partial terms or multiple partial terms where all the balls are unrepeated, then just take the inverse of each partial term by itself, right? So uh, in MATLAB, we find the partial terms using the residue uh, command, but then we have to con construct the inverse and then we can plot the function. So let's do that in uh, uh, let's do that this example in MATLAB and show you how we can use the residue command to find uh, the partial fraction expansion. But then we can we need to plot this function and see what kind of response we will get. So let me move to MATLAB and let me create a new script. And in this script, I'm going to call it uh, tutorial. 3 underscore 2 dot m. Let me save the script as tutorial tutorial 3 underscore 2 dot m. And the first thing I'm going to do is I want to enter the values of the rational function. So uh, I will use something like the num, which stands for the numerator coefficients. And this will equal to uh, uh, 1 and minus 1. And then I will have the denominator, which is a vector that contains the coefficients of the denominator. And here I will have 1, uh, 3, and 2. I want to add a new command for you. I want to call it print sys. Print sys is a command that will print the transfer function given the coefficients of the numerator and the denominator. So let's run that only once to show you how is parenthesis can be something that we might use. Now keep in mind that parenthesis will only work for proper functions. Okay. So let's run this and see what kind of response we will get when we do that. Ah, so when you look here, it says the command parenthesis gives me the numerator, denominator will equal to s minus 1 over s squared plus 3s plus 2. So the print s basically will print the transfer function for me. And this is just for us to check and see if we got the correct transfer function or not. I'm going to comment this line because at this moment I really don't need it. 
and then I'm going to use the residue command I'm gonna use R and P and I'm gonna stop why I don't need the G vector why because this function is proper I know the G vector will not contain any values I know uh, if the rational function is proper function which means the order of the numerator is less than the order of the denominator then uh, there will be no uh, polynomial coefficients that responsible for the uh, improper function so the g vector will be empty set so I don't need it so I will only return the values of r and p and then I will use the residue command and then I will pass the num and the den keep in mind that you always pass the numerator coefficients first and then the denominator coefficients uh, let me save this file what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna clear the, com uh, the command window so we see everything when we run the script that's shown in the screen so when I run the script unless we made any uh, errors uh, we should have the two vectors R and B so let's do that and see what we get yeah. so I have the values R and P and I have the value R is 3 that will be associated with vector with the ball located at minus 2 and then I have a value of minus 2 which is located at the vector uh, uh, the ball located at minus 1 so what we're gonna do next is we are going to plot this function so I will come back to the script and I'm going to semicolon this I already know the values of R and P so there is two ways to plot this function one of them is to construct uh, the inverse using the coefficients in the r and p vectors so what i will do is i will say that uh, t will equal to uh, we will start from zero to uh, with an increment of 0 0.001 all the way to 5 so this here is the time vector that I need to specify to plot the function right and then what I will do is I will call the function to be uh, h stands for h of t maybe this will equal to I need to plot the first function uh, or let's call it h1 and h1 will uh, give me uh, the plot of the first function and the first function basically will have uh, the, the value of r at 1 and then I will say times the exponential of the value of p at 1 that's the pole value times I'm using vector index multiplication here times t right and because the ball is negative I know that r1 will equal to 3 and p1 will equal to minus 2 and then I multiply that by the t index which is here right so this is the first partial term the inverse of the first partial term and then I will do h2 which is the inverse of the second partial term so that will be r2 times the exponential of p2 index multiplication times t so this is the inverse of h2 and now what I will do is I will say h will equal to h1 plus h2 right because Laplace a transform is a linear transformation if I get the inverse of the first one and the inverse of the second one and I add them up it is the same as getting the inverse of the whole function so now we are ready to plot the function so I will do plot and I would like to plot t versus h that's the first function right but I also want to plot the second and the third function so I will say I will plot t versus h1 and t versus h2 so here I have multiple plots on the same graph the first plot I have is t versus h which is this plot the second plot I have t versus h1 which is this plot 
And the third plot I have is T versus H2, which is this function. So now I'm going to plot the three functions on the same graph. Let's run the script and let's see what we are going to have. Ah, so here we have it, right? So uh, so this is one of them. And then let's see which one was. This is the minus 2 at a time constant of 3. And this is the plus 3 at a constant of minus 1. And that's the addition of both of them, right? And you can see that there is two time constants. One will start at 1. The other one will be somewhere around. Did I get that right? One. T yeah, let me do the grid to see it. I'm sorry. Let me go back and do the grid. The grid will give me grid on. And then let me also do uh, Yeah, that's good enough. Let's run and see what we have. Okay, so here it starts at 2, and to get 70% of that will be somewhere around... Should be somewhere around 3, that's here. And then... The, no, no, around 2, yeah, yeah, here. It's around two. So yeah, there is a ball around two. That's that's what it is. I thought the ball is around three, but no, the ball is around two. So there is a ball around two. And then there is another ball here will be around one, which is somewhere around here, right? So it loses 70% of its value around one, and the other one loses 70% of its value around two. And this is the combination of those two. You can see that it goes up very fast because of the one ball because of the ball at one and then you can see that it went up a little bit because the second function is kicking in right you can see that around this area let me zoom in this area yeah you can see that it goes down and then it goes up again because the first function dies which has the ball at one and the ball at two still continues to kick in right so So that's what we have, is two time constants, one will die faster than the other one. So the overall function will have the combination of two. When the first ball dies, the second ball still continues to kick in into the whole function. So that's what we have here. Anyway, so let's move to the next slide and see what kind of inverse functions do we have. So the next case we have is what we call the unrepeated complex poles. What happens if we have unrepeated complex poles? So let's give you a very simple example. In this transfer function, we have this particular transfer function where the, inver where the partial fraction expansion for it will have one simple pole and two complex conjugate poles, right? So how will we do that in MATLAB? Well, MATLAB will give you the values using the residue command of all those partial terms and the poles located at each of those partial terms. Right? So when you get the inverse, the inverse of those functions is uh, very simple. Let's show you how we do the inverse. Uh, in this particular example, I convert the values of the uh, uh, partial terms that are complex values into magnitude and phase. So this will be magnitude and phase, and this will be magnitude and phase. Keep in mind that if you have complex poles, the poles will be complex conjugates. So does their coefficients will be complex conjugates. Why? Because when I add those two, two terms together, I will end up with real coefficients. The original function is real coefficients. Because a complex function plus its complex conjugate give you a real function. That's what you begin with, right? So when we take the inverse, the inverse of Laplace transform is very straightforward once you put it in this form. Very easy to do. 
the first pole is a simple pole you can get the inverse of a simple pole for those ones what you do is you say you come to the term where it says s plus some real value minus imaginary value right this will be the exponential decaying coefficient and this value will be the term that goes inside the cosine the magnitude of uh, the value you multiply it by 2 so if you have 1.76 for example when you multiply it by 2 you get 3.535 times e to the minus 1 t the minus 1 here comes from the real part of the root times the cosine of t the coefficient of t here the cosine of 1t I have 1t because this is the magnitude of the imaginary part of the pole so the real part of the pole will give you the exponential decaying part the imaginary part of the pole will give you the oscillation frequency inside the cosine term now what's left is basically the phase of uh, the magnitude of the partial uh, value of the one that has minus imaginary part in this case will be 171.87 degrees that will be the phase shift added to the cosine so that's how you get the uh, inverse of Laplace transform of complex poles so let's do that in MATLAB and let's see how we can uh, how are we gonna do that it's not uh, very straightforward it requires us to do multiple intermediate steps so let me uh, uh, create a new script here so I will do a new script and I will comment this line to say this is tutorial 3 underscore 3 dot M let me save it and I will save it as tutorial 3 underscore 3 Dot M. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to enter the numerators of this uh, uh, rational function and the numerators are basically uh, 1 minus, oops, let me open bracket, 1 minus 2 and 1 and then the denominator which is 1, 4, 6, and 4. Let's make sure I have the right coefficients here. 1 minus 2 and 1, and then 1, 4, 6, and 4. Yep. And then I'm going to do print sys here just to verify. So print sys is a command that will give me the transfer function. Let me come to the command window and clear the command window and ah, here you go okay. and do that and this okay so now what I'm gonna oops okay my computer start to act crazy but this is what I have here is I said that I have the coefficients of the numerator and the denominator and what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, show the transfer function or the rational function of those coefficients when I do that I definitely have s squared minus 2s plus 1 over s cubed plus 4s squared plus 6s plus 4 that's what I have so I come back to the script command and I will comment this line because I already verified it and now I will look for the residue uh, command so I will have R and P I'm not gonna need the G because this is proper function and then we're gonna say the residue of the num and din and let's see what we get when we do that Ah, so here uh, I have three values one is simple pole with a value of 4.5 at s equals minus 
two, and then I have those two. I have I have those two complex conjugate values at uh, ball will be uh, s minus one plus j, and at s will equal to minus one minus j. So the one with the plus one j or one i or the one with the positive is the one that the phase the phase shift we will we, we need the phase shift of its coefficient to give us the phase shift within the cosine term so the problem is almost solved to find the inverse what i will do is over here i will have two functions again one for the simple pole so if i want to plot the inverse i will have i have to define t first and t will go from zero with an increment of I would say 0 0.001 will go all the way let's say to 5 uh, and then uh, I will define the first function which is h1 h1 will be the inverse of the first pole and the inverse of the first pole is uh, uh, easily found it will be basically uh, it will equal to r at 1 that's the value r1 right uh, multiplied by the exponential of uh, I will have p at 1 which is the pole that located at minus 2 multiplied by and that's index multiplication t which is the vector t so this will be the first function, which is an exponential decaying function. And then h2, which is the inverse of those two poles combined, that will be basically two times the absolute value, which is the magnitude of r2. That's the magnitude times the exponential function of the real part of p2 so i will say the real of p located at 2 and then that will be index multiplied by time so that's basically the exponential decaying function and then that's still multiplied by the cosine term so the cosine term got to be a uh, got to be an index multiplication because this function here is a vector because I have a t term in it and the cosine term will also be a vector so I have to do an index vector multiplication here so I have to multiply by the cosine of what I call the imaginary the image the image or you can call it the image the imaginary part of p2 And then that's multiplied by, let me bring it uh, a little bit here. That's multiplied by uh, the index t. And then I still need to add the phase shift. So that will be plus the phase in, in MATLAB is called angle. So the angle of R2. And that should be the second function and then finally h will be h1 plus h2 so let me plot h1 let me plot h2 and let me plot h uh, the total h using subplots so we can analyze them all separately so i will say subplot and i will have uh, let's say three rows one column the first graph that will be plot at t versus h1 so in the first plot I will only plot the exponential decaying function and then we're gonna say grid on so we can see the grid and then I will go to sub plot 3 1 the second plot and that will plot the second function which is h2 here 
So this will be T versus H2. And we're still going to have grid on. I don't need to start here. And finally, I will have plot, uh, subplot, sub. Subplot uh, three, one, that's the third graph. And we're going to say plot T versus H. And then I have grid on. So let's run this command and see what we have. What I did here is I defined. Let's go from the beginning and show you in this command what we did. We said we have a rational function. This rational function is proper rational function. Then you find the values of the partial terms and the poles using the residue command. And when we did this, we found out that the, 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 there are complex poles in this transfer function or in this rational function. Then what we did, we said that let's find the inverse of each function and we want to plot the inverse of the function. So I have to define the t variable, which is the time index. And we said that this will be a vector. We'll start from 0 to, to 5 with n increments of 0 0.01. And when we looked at the uh, balls, we saw that there is three balls here. One is simple ball, and the other ones are two complex conjugate. So what I did, I said that I'm going to plot one function for the simple ball by itself and another function for the combination of those two complex conjugate functions. So the simple pole, which is the one located at 2, is very easy. You say that the value r at 1, which is 4.5, times the exponential of the value of the pole, which is 2, times t. When we come to the second function, if we go on to plot the combination of those two complex conjugate functions, what we do is we say that the function and the inverse, the inverse in the time domain, the function will be twice the magnitude of the partial term. So twice the magnitude of this. This is a complex number. Its magnitude can be found as the square root of this squared plus that squared. In MATLAB, we use the command absolute ABS of R2. So the absolute value will give me the magnitude of that. I multiply it by 2. And then I say the exponential of the real part of the second pole. Here is the second pole, the exponential of the real part. The real part is minus 1. So I get the exponential of minus 1 times t. So it will be e to the minus 1 t. And then I have to multiply it by the cosine. The cosine will have the t term inside the cosine has the oscillating frequency of the imaginary part of the pole. So I say that cosine of the imaginary part of the pole, which is 1, so I will say cosine of 1 times t, and you still have to add a phase to this cosine term, which I call the angle, the command called the angle, that's the phase, and that will be the phase of R2, which is the one shown here. See. So it is very straightforward example. So when we do that, let me run the script and let's see what we have. Unless, oh, we didn't make an error, excellent. Okay. So that's what we have. The first function is a symbol ball function, right? And the second function is an oscillating function. It's not very clear it is oscillating here because the exponential decaying lose its value at 1 very quick. So you don't have enough time to show the oscillation. But if, for example, I increase t and you zoom in this part, you can see that it's going back again to the minus 1, right? So it is really actually a sinusoidal exponential decaying function. Now when you combine those two, that's what you have, right? Because one of the functions, which is this one, will die at 2 while the sine wave will die around 1. You see? 
So that's the kind of function you will get when you combine both both terms or that's the inverse the last plot here is the inverse of the Laplace trans, uh, transform of the rational function we get, we shown you so let's move to the last plot uh, uh, the last case to find the inverse here so the last case will be what happens if we have repeated uh, uh, real balls so we have repeated balls so in this particular transfer function we have when we take the partial uh, fraction expansion we will end up with uh, 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 those terms so you can see that I have a ball at s equals 2 repeated three times and I still have another simple unrepeated ball so I have a repeated ball at s equals 2 three times then when you take the partial fraction expansion of it you know that you're going to include this ball with uh, which is s plus 2 to the power of 2 and then also a term for s plus 2 to the power of 1 so we already know that and then when we find the inverse we're going to find the inverse of each term individually so i find the inverse of this plus the inverse of that plus the inverse of this and then finally simple this is very is how we in MATLAB uh, how we do that in MATLAB and how we will be able to uh, find uh, the inverse of uh, repeated balls. So let's enter this function into uh, the script file. I will start with a comment and I will call that tutorial 3 underscore 4 dot m and then I will have the numerator coefficients and the numerator coefficients will be 2 minus 18 let me make the minus very close here 18 and then I have 46 and then I have minus 3 and then the denominator, which will have the values of 1, 7, 18, 20, and 8. So I'm going to do uh, the parentheses first just to verify that I have the same rational function. And let's run this script. Have to save it. Ah. Okay, so let's verify that I have the same rational function. I have 2s cubed plus 18s squared plus 46s minus 3. The numerator is correct. And then I have s to the 4 plus 7s cubed plus 18s squared plus 20s plus 8. So this is also correct. Then I'm going to comment this line. And what I will do now is I will find R and P. I don't need G. This is proper function. And that will equal to the residue of num and dim. Let's run this file. So when we look at the residue, that's what we see. We see the values of each partial term but we go to the poles and at the poles we see that we have minus 2 minus 2 minus 2 then minus 1 so it is obvious that I have three repeated poles the first one you're gonna see when you have three repeat repeated poles will be the one with the with the power of 1 so uh, Basically, the first poll says that the value of that first portion is 71. So you will say this will be 71 divided by s plus 2 because the poll is to the order of 1 here. The second term, which is the 41, will be the poll associated with the s plus 2 squared. And the third one, which is the 183, 
will be associated with the s plus 2 to the power of cube so let me go back to uh, uh, to the slide here uh, so what we said is the first pole you're gonna see will be the term that's associated with s plus 2 the second value will be associated with s plus 2 squared and the third value is associated with s plus 2 cubed let's say you forget right because sometimes we forget uh, how our uh, each command is uh, is running or, or the conditions of each room. What's the conditions of each command? So sometimes you forget what's the conditions of each command. So one way to do that is to remind yourself is by writing the help command. So what you do is you do help residue. And when you run the help residue, it will show you everything you need to know about the help, right? So it tells you that's the partial fraction expansion, which means residue. And then somewhere it will tell you here if uh, you have uh, something like multiple poles here, right? So it tells you that the partial expansion, the partial fraction expansion will start with the order, the ball with the power of one, then the power of two, then the power of three, all the way to the power of m. Right? When you read it, it will show you that the balls start from the first order all the way to the m order if the ball is repeated m times. So you go back to the help menu and you read it. it the, the help menu might be a little bit difficult for you to read at the beginning, but as soon as you get used to it, and which is something that can be fairly quickly, like maybe within a few weeks of intensively using MATLAB, that you will be able to read the help menu and understand it fairly quickly so by any means use help if you forget the rules of the command and this applies to every almost every command you have for example you can say help the abs which stands for absolute value it will give you the absolute value of a vector and when x is complex the absolute value is the magnitude of the element right and you get the sign and the angle and all that so any command you have in matlab you can use the help menu for it to help you to do so. By any means, let's go back to the script now. And uh, uh, let me clear the window, the command window. And let's go to the script and let's run the script and see what we have. So what we said we have, when you look at the balls, you have three repeated balls. The first one will be the one to the first power. The second one will be the one to the second power. And the third one will be the one to the third power. And then we have also a symbol pole at one. So to do uh, the inverse of this rational function is uh, also something that uh, you can do by finding the inverse of each partial term, and then you can plot it. I'm not going to do that here. You can do that in your own. But you should be able to plot this function, which will have four different partial terms. You have one at s equal minus 2 and one is at s equal minus two to the power of two, and then you have one will equal to uh, one at s equals to uh, minus two to the power of three, and then you have the last one is at one, uh, uh, the one is at s equals minus one. All right, so you can do that by yourself, and now you know how to find the inverse of Laplace transforms using MATLAB.